Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kelly Baisley, School and Family Programs Manager here at the Asheville Art Museum. Today I'm joined by Hank Bovey, Touring Docent. Each Friday at 12 p.m., docents lead virtual interactive conversations about a few artworks in our collection or special exhibitions. The goal is simple, slow down, discover the joy of looking at art, and talk about the experience with others. For today's program, Hank will lead us in an interactive conversation about four artworks in our collection. We'll spend about 15 minutes, maybe 10, 12 to 15 minutes or so with each artwork, and Hank will allow us time to look at each artwork on our own slowly before leading a conversation about each one with questions. As participants, we encourage you to engage in dialogue with Hank, myself, and each other throughout the hour. Some ground rules. We have your microphones muted by default right now. We encourage you to select a quiet room and close the door and silence any devices you might have nearby. Try not to sit directly in front of a, a light source. Use headphones and a microphone for the best sound quality and use a desktop, laptop, or tablet to see the biggest picture in the best picture quality. Make sure your screen name includes your first name and last name or last initial. To ask questions or make comments, you'll be able to unmute yourself uh, when the moderator asks. You can also type in the chat box or you can raise your hand in the participant sidebar, sidebar and we will call on you. We are recording, so if you prefer not to be recorded, make sure that you keep your video off and your audio muted and use the chat box for any comments or questions. Do we have any questions at this time? Okay, Hank, what will we be talking about today? You could, there you go, I'm unmuted. So good afternoon, everyone. As Kelly said, I'm Hank Bovey. And um, I see a lot of familiar faces today, so welcome back. I see a couple of new folks, so I'm at least new to my Slow Art Friday. So uh, <laughs> thanks so much for joining us. And before I talk about the topic, I want to compliment some of you on your virtual backgrounds. Um, <laughs> it's kind of interesting to see how we've all evolved on Zoom and gotten more and more proficient <laughs> with it. So as the, as the summer's gone by, so good job, folks. So today our topic is, is it art? And if you notice, it said part three. I did my first is it art many months ago. And what led me to do that is I did a topic not related to is it art. And one of the artworks that we discussed on that Flow Art Friday was a photograph. And one of the participants asked the question, well, is that art or is it just a document? It was a photograph of a performance. So she was asking, was it just a document of the performance or was it art? So we had a little discussion around that, but I thought, you know, that's a very good topic because as a docent, um, that's one example I gave you, but also in the museum when I've done in-person tours, a couple of times, especially on some abstract works, folks have said, well, is that art or what makes that something that hangs in a museum? So I thought it's a good topic. So we did that and it was, awesome. People had so much insight into the works we looked at that some of them I had had been on several tours and, and used those artworks, but the folks gave me a whole new view of them. So Christy McMillan, who's sort of the uh, the manager of this Slow Art Friday, um, she said, you know, could you do that again? So we did a second as an art. And then since then I've done some other topics and then when I was figuring out what topic we should do for today. I thought, you know what, there, I can't beat is it art. I always have such good discussions. The participants have such um, great insight into these pieces that I want to do it again. So here we are. So today we have four pieces and also a movie at the end, a little short video. So um, I may be pushing this along time-wise because I want to make sure we see everything but hopefully I think we'll get a lot of good discussion in. And as Kelly said, um, you know, I'm going to ask you to, some questions. Please just jump in there. J you know, you can either just jump into the conversation, use the chat box, or raise your hand electronically or physically. Um, I would encourage you just to jump in for some open dialogue. Plus, I'll be honest, I'm really bad at keeping up with the chat box. 
Um, but then I know Kelly will have me look at that. But again, if, if you're if you feel like it, just jump in there. With that said, uh, we'll look at the first piece. So take a few moments to look at this. I'll, I'll shut up and let you look at it, and then we'll kind of talk about it. All right, folks, um, we've had a couple of moments to look at this work. So um, I'm going to ask the first question is, what is going on in this artwork? What do you see? I almost see like confetti. It sort of gives me like an idea of like somebody just threw like something up in the air, some sort of confetti. And um, the colors are quite vibrant. So it kind of gives me like a happy feeling there. So very much. I can see the confetti comparison and yeah, it is sort of a, a festive little a piece there. So very good. What else can we see? In the chat, someone says it looks like a birthday card. And that's that same kind of happy time look that, that was just described. Anybody else see anything? Well, let's look at it this way. If we saw different colors, how would that look? Let's say if the background was blue, and of course we didn't have the blue squares in there, we had another color, what would that look like? So, so in the chat, um, Hetty sees movement. Um, and, and talk about that. What, what do you see that makes you say that? What do you see that makes you uh, think there's movement? Is anybody else? I, I see a form now uh, with the colors. So I see like a shape S's and eights and just movement with the way the colors flow around the, the, uh, the paper. So uh, is it fair to say that just for the randomness of the colors and the shapes gives it a sense of movement? Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting on the sizes of the squares and the rectangles and the positioning. And if you look at the colors, the green has multiple shades where to me the blue looks more like that iridesc iridescent glowy type blue. And I do think if it was reversed and the blue squares were the background and the red were the squares, it, it would give a different feeling to it. Yes, and, and I see what you mean about the green, and that I think that uh, the different shades of green do give it a bit more movement. Um, and I, I like the blue; it really stands out. So I'm with you there. Um, and let's see on the chat. Uh, Susan says, "Looking down from above." So, um, Susan, if you could share a little bit more on when you say "looking down from above." Um, well, when, when you mentioned um, looking at it as if the background was blue, I immediately thought, oh, I'm looking down at the ocean and those are like rafts or something floating in the ocean. And now, even though I'm, I, it's red as I'm looking at it, I can't stop thinking I'm looking down at something from above, like chairs <laughs> or something scattered on a red floor. And now that you say that, I'm with you 100%. That's exactly what I see too, that, that this very much could be that view of your, it's an aerial view of something in the squares. Like you said, it could be rafts, could be chairs. So, so very good point. Um, what else do we see? So let me ask you this, outside of the, the red-orange, and depending on your screen, it, it may be a different color, but the background, 
or the Irish sugar, whatever you want to call it. What other color is predominant? What's the predominant color in this piece? Blue. It's the blue. Um, and does that does that change things for you? If, once you identify that blue, if you look at the, is there any kind of pattern of that blue? Does that help give it that that dynamic feeling that we've described? On my screen, at least, it looks as if the blue is outlined. The, the blue squares and rectangles are outlined in some sort of a black or darker color. I don't know if that's just or my screen, but the other pieces don't appear to be outlined, but yet you see them. So, and I see the same thing, so I don't think it's your screen. Mm, I don't see it. I see it too, and I think it's because of the contrast of the colors. Um, the blue almost seems lit up compared to the other colors. Well, exactly. You know, and if you were to look at the color wheel, it'd be interesting to see where the blue in the background sit. I'm going to guess they're almost across the color wheel from each other. Um, and then in uh, the comments, uh, here's a great one, very timely. Um, Lorraine says, a colorful depiction of social distancing. So <laughs> excellent observation there. We could, we could even retitle this. Um, <laughs> And then Claire makes a very interesting point, like a Joseph Albers color exercise. And, and by the way, can you, can you expand on that? What, you know, um, I, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Joseph Albers, so if you could kind of, why do you think this might be a, uh, a color exercise, like a Joseph Albers piece? Well, it has the same effect when you see the edges of the color, like you were just saying, it almost looks like they're um, outlined. And when you see his color charts, then cert putting certain colors next to each other really um, plays with your eyes in that way when there isn't actually an edge of a different color, but just um, the two colors next to each other really create that kind of energy, almost as if they're moving. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. And, and that is very Joseph Albers. He did a lot of experiments in color and shape. And also, like you said, um, it, it, it's actually a very simple piece, but just that play of color uh, makes it more complex. So anybody else have anything they see here? To me, it feels like the colors keep changing place. Like, um, I just, all of it, it's like an optical illusion. I was just looking at it and suddenly thought, all those colors are underneath cutouts in the red. It, you know, it keeps changing to me. Right, you look, away, look back and it looks different. Yeah, like um, I had assumed that the colored squares and, and rectangles were on top of the red, and now I'm thinking they could be under the red. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good observation. and. and and there again, that's part of that movement that we've talked about, that that color gives it all that movement, not only, say, movement across the plane, but also up and down. So anybody else say anything? Somebody's out in the yard. Um, <laughs> So if we go back to our theme for today, is it art? Do you all think this is art? Huh? Mm -hmm. I do. I think it's art. Mm -hmm. and I, I agree with whoever earlier said about being a birthday card. I could see that as the cover of a birthday card. Well, yeah, but are birthday cards really art? I mean, I could see this as if those colors were all cut out, you know, a kindergartner could paste them on there. So, I mean, I guess that's art, but I'm not sure I understand why it's in an art museum. It could be on somebody's refrigerator. Well, and I think that goes back and 
is see what is art, you know, and we could have a, probably finish the hour talking about what is art. Um, but if you think about what art is, it's not necessarily a pretty picture that you hang on the wall kind of thing. I mean, you know, art is a, is a great communication tool, you know, um, so if we think about it from that aspect, you know, just in this little 10 or 15 minutes discussion, we've talked about how this piece communicates um, color, communicates movement, it looks like a birthday card, and I think actually there is art on birthday cards, maybe not all of them, mm -hmm. and I think there's art hanging on refrigerators. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, so I would say it's art, but if does anyone think it's not art? And, you know, we're not going to, like, say, well, what do you mean? But does anyone think this is not art? Well, then I'm going to say we, we agree that it's, we all agree it's art. I thought I heard a little something there. Yep. So, and just to give you a little bit of background on this artist and this piece, the artist is John Urbain, and this is untitled, so there's no title to, to help us figure out what's going on here. It is watercolor on paper. It's 11 and 3 eighths by 8 and 3 eighths inches. So it's pretty much the size of a sheet of, of uh, computer paper. There you go. It is, um, it, John Urbain was born in Brussels, Belgium in 1920. He died in, in 2009. Um, he and his family immigrated to Detroit at age two. He was drafted in uh, 1941 and was an illustrator for the Army. He did some Army training graphics. He did some Army murals. And then when he got out of the Army, he went to Black Mountain College on the GI Bill. And if, if you're not familiar with Black Mountain College, it was a liberal arts college in uh, Black Mountain that is no longer in operation. I think it ceased operation in about 1957 or so. I mean, Kelly, you may know that. I'm not good on dates. Um, but it, it primarily wanted Black Mountain Colleges, it was an experimental school in that there was a strong focus on art and art was pretty much intertwined into the entire curriculum. Um, and back to an earlier comment, um, Claire's comment, when he was at Black Mountain College, one of his instructors was Joseph Albers, and he was very influenced by Joseph Albers. So obviously we saw that, you know, Claire commented on it looked like a Joseph mm -hmm. Albers exercise. And then uh, if you look at the Joseph Albers pieces that are in the museum's collection, they are, are pretty much experiments or, or studies in color and shape using squares. And, and then in 1946, John Urbain moved to Paris with his wife, Elaine Schmidt, another artist. He studied art at the Academy de la Grande Chamier. And when he came back to the United States, he was the art director for Philip Morris for 25 years and was very responsible for a lot of their corporate collection, which is, um, I understand, one of the better corporate art collections out there. So any other comments or questions before we move on? All righty then, Kelly, if you would go to the next one. And there again, take a few moments, look at this, and then we'll talk about it. All right, let's go ahead and talk about it. Before we talk about it, let me give you a little bit of information on this. It is actually a sculptural piece. It is a cube, uh -huh. and it is uh, made out of cut glass polyester resin. Um, so it's not a painting or anything. So that might help you as you look at that. So with that said, what do you see here? What's going on in this piece? Is it the same on all sides, Hank? It is. What's going on here? Okay. I just see a pink square box. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, to be, and that's kind of what we all see, I think. But um, <laughs> I put this in here because that pretty much is what I've thought. But then I started reading up on the artist. And let me give you one thing. And the artist his vision is one of creating a generative object. 
So if you think about generative object and, and look at this piece, does that stimulate anything that you see a little differently? Is, you know, um, anybody want to make a stab at what a generative object is? Go ahead, Carol, I see your hand up. I, I mute yourself, so. Did you? Go on to the next person, it's confusing. Oh, did you say generative? Generative, G-E-N, yes. Because it looks like it's shaded. It looks like the top looks lighter and the bed in front of us is a little darker. I think they're trying to generate or suggest contrast. If that is a little bit lighter and a little bit darker, maybe the play of contrast. And if it is an object, depending where it is, there may be shadows and light might be bouncing off of it or could as well. So, and I think you raise a couple of very valid points here. Um, and obviously generative object is an object that generates something, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and in this case, you mentioned contrast. Well, what is contrast basically a function of? Uh, light. Exactly. It's a function of light. So, if this does not have a light source, I think it wouldn't mislead you or anything. But, uh -huh. you know, I think what you said about the contrast is very much a part of this piece is that it, 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 it seems to generate its own light and that you saw contrast there which indeed may be because of the environment it's sitting in as far as shadows where the light source is. But again, the piece actually takes those variables and, and, and uses those as part of that generative object um, view. I saw something in the chat. Mm -hmm. So Claire, it feels like it has the essence of a ballerina. Mm -hmm. um, and Claire, mm -hmm. can, what do you see that makes you say that? Uh, it's really just my first impression. Um, you know, a, a lot of times a, <clears throat> a, a very simple um, object will just conjure something in your psyche um, and you kind of just, you know, you, you, it's almost like when you see something represented in a dream, you just know what it is. It's that kind of feeling, so that <clears throat> conjures something about the essence of, of a ballerina. Um, the, the, maybe the um, color has that softness, the and the, the way the light is on it. I will hear it. So, and I agree that there's, you know, because I'll be honest, it makes me think of a big pink marshmallow. So for you, it's, it's a ballerina. It has really nothing to do with with what you're actually seeing, but it just gives you that sort of sense, like you said, sort of like the symbolism in dreams. Um, and I think the pink color may contribute to that because you mentioned color. And, and there again, if we go back to that generative object, hmm. you know, we talked about light, here's another um, facet of, the, of what it might be generating and that's color. Oh, yeah. I could see with the color, it makes me think maybe like of cotton candy or bubble gum or, or, or things like that that have, you know, pinkish tones to them. But I also now in looking at it want to find uses for it. So I could easily see, and I think someone referred to that in the chat, of like putting something on top of it. Like if it were in your home in a room and maybe put like a nice green plant on it. Or perhaps it could almost be in a child's room, like a pink toy box, something of that nature. So besides being some light and color, it has some utilitarian aspects to it as well, it sounds like. And, and then in the chat, um, Lorraine says, a cube awaiting decorative touches. So I'm gonna say Lorraine almost looks at it as just being almost like a canvas. Mm -hmm. um, and then Hetty um, <laughs> mentions the perspective of looking down onto the cube. So that's part of it too. So it's generating some dimensionality there as far as, um, you know, besides color as light, we also have depth and height. So what else do we see? So 
so um, it, this one I thought we would have the least amount of conversation around. So, I mean, I'm not surprised that because it, it's hard to say much beyond it's a pink cube. And perhaps where that's what the artist intended. You know, we don't know. But with all that said, is it art? Yes, I say yes because it has form and purpose, or it had it, it came from an imagination, and there was an intention uh, of doing this piece. And it seems that it um, <clears throat> certainly it addressed the issue of color, and uh, I guess you have to look at intention and at uh, um, but, and what it kind of is generating too is a conversation between functionality and just art for art's sake, because some people want to put a plant on it and someone else is trying to keep it art. So it's... Um, I don't know. You, you, you actually made me think of something uh, when you mentioned the um, color and light. If you think about art and the elements of art, color, light, line, shape, and so on, um, this has all of that. So it's just this artist chose to um, use those elements versus say Monet. So um, the same elements are there, just a different way of using them. So so to me, that kind of helps support the, is it art? Mm -hmm. It is art um, theory. Uh, Barbara says more like an object of display art than art itself. I agree. <laughs> so that's, Two folks aren't sure this is art. And then Virginia actually in the comment says, um, I'm not sure it's art. She says, does art imply communication? And not necessarily, but that is, you know, and I'm not the expert on what art is. It's very much, um, I think we could all have our own definition of what's art. To me though, art does communicate. If you look at, you know, art historically, a lot of times it does send a message um, or, or just an emotion or whatever. Um, so, and so it sounds like we're almost split on whether this is art. I would also add that um, this is a very different piece in the museum, not obviously just because of its dimensionality, but because it faces a painting which is of the same color. Oh. And, and so it's, and the painting has a little bit more variation in terms of shading. Um, and so the combination really um, changes, I think, the way that some of us look at the piece. When it's just separate, <coughs> as I said, I see it more like a display than the art itself. Mm -hmm. Yep, I, I think that's a good point. And it kind of made me think of, you know, if we also look at art, especially contemporary art, um, which is, you know, the museum's hallmark is, is 20th and 21st century art, a big part of contemporary art is experimentation. You know, it's not necessary to make a pretty picture or, or whatever, or a depiction of Jesus or, or whatever, you know, previous artists have done. It's experimentation. So from that perspective, you know, we might not like this piece or consider it art, but it definitely, I think, um, we can say, hey, we can see where he was experimenting with shape and color and light. Mm -hmm. So, and also the fact that we've had a 15 minute discussion around this piece on whether it's not as art, what we see, you know, you know I'm not going to say that makes it art, but it makes you want to think about it. So let's talk about, let me give you a little bit of rundown on this artist. Um, his name is Peter Alexander. This piece is from 2009. Mm. Um, Peter Alexander was born in 1939 in Los Angeles and actually just passed away this past May. Um, he originally intended to be an architect. And I suppose you could maybe see uh. some of that in this piece. Um, and so he went to several different schools, but he ended up getting his Bachelor of Arts from UCLA and his MFA from UCLA as well. And I think, you know, if you think about California and California colors, you can kind of see some of that in this piece. Um, and he did do an active exploration of resins and color, transparency and translucence, 
there again, we talked about, I talk, at least I talked about experimentation, and, and that's exactly what he's doing here, I think, in this piece, is experimenting with materials or resins, color, transparency, translucence, this is, you know, sort of both. I talked about this vision was one of creating a generative object, you know, and um, he likes to create an entity that appears to emit its own light and energy. And so that kind of falls back to the original, the very first comment about seeing that contrast there mm -hmm. in the piece. Even though it has no light source, it still was able to generate some contrast. So excellent. I was curious how this piece would go today. So you all did not disappoint me. You know, it's, much, it's much smaller than I think we were thinking it. I was thinking it was much bigger. I don't know why, because... And I, yeah, I don't think I gave you the dimensions at the beginning of our discussion. Yeah. Um, but it's it's not that big. And as um, I think Barbara mentioned, as a matter of fact, it would make a nice pedestal for something in your house. Yeah. Um, if, if you so choose, chose to use it that way. Okay. Any other comments or, or uh, questions on this piece? All right, Kelly, if you would give us the next one. And then let's take, take a few moments, look at it, and then we'll talk about it. So, all right, what's going on in this work of art? What do you see there? It has an odd rippling effect. It almost, um, my eyes drawn to the center portion where the bright white light is there. And then as the dark comes from the bottom and from right, and then from the top, the green coming down. And it almost looks like it's moving. Like it can almost hurt your eye. <laughs> it's like this <clears throat> kind of odd rippling effect. So here again, we even though we are looking at a static painting, and this is a uh, this is a painting, or it's actually a, a screen or a, a serigraph, uh, mm. a print, but um, we see movement. So so good observation there. In the chat, um, Virginia says aurora borealis question mark curtains. So it it I'm going to assume you're reminding you of of those two things, and I can certainly see the curtains just where it looks like there's um, pleats or whatever, and also the colors. It, you know, I've not seen the Aurora Borealis other than in photographs, but this is what I imagine it might look like. Maybe not quite these same colors. I don't know if it's because of what I've been seeing lately on TV, but it looks like the fires in California <laughs> to me. It looks like, you know, you could see a city there, and then it's totally covered up by things in the sky that are coming from the sky. So I can see that now that you mentioned it. Like I said, that's why I like these is it arts because you all have such great insight. You see so many different things. And I can see the fires where you have the dark buildings down below and then the flame mm -hmm. getting up into the sky, which gives it sort of a almost a threatening um, look almost, huh? I, so I'm, uh, I, I think it's showing us that white can be a color. We don't necessarily, I don't usually think of white in a painting as being a color. It looks it's sort of like it's waiting to have some color on it. I mean, unless you're doing a snow scene or something. But it's reminding us white itself has the potential of being it is a color and it can be used and seen like a color and it's I, it's hard to express what i'm trying to say but it, it's contrasted by the reddish and the black but it's reminding us that the, that the just white which we tend to think is blank can create space to shape and and and, and hold in hold that in it instead of just being a blank does that make sense? It makes tons of sense, you know, that the white here is not negative space. It's actually yeah. part of the piece. And also, 
if you go back to the very first comment, it was that her eye was drawn to the center mm -hmm. of, of the uh, print. And that's where the white is. So the white's actually being used here to draw your eye to that center. So I get what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting too that when the red with the white coming from the bottom makes a different color, so to speak, because then I see pink mm -hmm. coming from the top where the white meets the darker green. I don't see a different color. I see a different shade. So I see a lighter green as opposed to from the bottom up, I see a pink color. So the white there again, as you mentioned, the white is being used to create different color, different shades. So again, it's not just blank old boring white. It's a, it's a very much a critical part of this. Um, and then the, it's like the rain in the comments said a colorful customized EKG. Um, and I can certainly <laughs> see that. I'm not sure what the prognosis is for this patient, but. <laughs> and then uh, Virginia says this just continuity between top and bottom. What is out of the bottom is in on the top to my eyes. And, and could you kind of clarify that, what you're saying when you say what's out of the bottom is in on the top? Well, it, it looks like a curtain, as I said, with folds going in and out. Mm. And on the top, the fold that comes out toward me, in my perspective, if I follow that down vertically, um, the fold is in on the bottom yeah. where it's red. Mm -hmm. Now I understand. I see exactly what you're saying. And there again, I've looked at this piece, and that's the first time I've seen that. Um, but very good. So, you know, as you say at the top, it looks like the fold is yeah. on the bottom is convex. Maybe you have that backwards. Um, but yes, and that's all due to that color as the, it transitions through the white. Mm -hmm. I could see a shower curtain. I could see this in a bathroom as a shower curtain. So, and our shower curtains are? They can be, right? So what else do we see in this piece? It looks like the white are columns of light coming up. Um, reminiscent of how they uh, show the World Trade Center in lights on every September 11th. But what's interesting to me is, and I found this with the first piece too, not so much this piece, with abstract art, the longer I look at it, more different it looks from how it looked when I first looked at it. Um, and I guess I usually, when I'm in a museum, I usually pass by the abstract pretty quickly because it doesn't grab me in, but it's really interesting how these pieces change the more I look at them. So, and I really appreciate your comment there because I know exactly what you mean is is that abstract art, and I think that's part of what a lot of contemporary artists, when we talk, I talked about how they experiment, that's what they're trying to get you to do. They're trying to get you to stop and look and see beyond the surface of the painting. You know, if you go to the museum, you know, you see the picture of the woman arranging flowers on the left or whatever, and the, the guys that work in that little gallery to the right, and they're very representational, so they're very easy to identify with. This one, and um, just like the pink cube, you might just go a pink cube and walk on by it. This one, you might go oh, shower curtain and walk on by it. Um, but as you said, if you stop and look at it, you start to see some of that experimenting that the artist was going for as far as the movement. Uh, it, it looks like curtains. We look, we see light coming up from the bottom, sort of like 9 11 um, memorial as illuminated. Um, so, I think it's an excellent point as far as, as how we look at abstract art. Mm -hmm. I, I think it begs the question too in abstract art, to me anyway, I think it's so important for them to title it, give it a title rather than Opus 1 or Opus 10 or something, 
And the reason I'm saying that is because that, let's say he's call, causing this, calling this waves, for example, it at least invites you in to being, begin the conversation. Does that mean, so titling it to me can be very important. Unlike when we see representational art, I kind of get it. It's a guy in a boat. You know, I don't, you know, I can recognize what it is, but titling, so I'm interested to see what the titles to this might be. It, 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 it's an interesting comment, and, um, you know, on the slower Fridays, and I've gone back and forth with Christy as far as sometimes we put that title slide first, and sometimes we decide to put it after, because there's, you know, we've, there's kind of pros and cons there. If you put it first, you know, as you said, it kind of gives you some clues as to what, what might be going on in the artist's mind, you know, but also sometimes I think it might influence what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, so you're, you know, you, you stop looking kind of thing because you go, okay, it's, it's a sour curtain, uh, you know, or whatever the title might be. That's not the title of this. Um, <laughs> so it's, a, it's a good discussion point there is, is what works best. Mm -hmm. Well, I, if this had a title like Wave, then I would have looked for wave, you know, what's some kind of wave in there. Whereas um, I wouldn't feel free to look at it and think, oh, that looks like the wildfires in on the West Coast, or, oh, that looks like lights coming up like 9-11. It, it wouldn't make connections with other things in my mind because mm -hmm. I'd be focused on what kind of wave is that? Where's the wave, you know? Good point. Right. I think that's a good point. And um, I was thinking, Susan, how you said when you're in the in a museum that you would kind of tend to breeze past an abstract work and we're giving ourselves time right now because we're basically forcing you to look at this for a long time to where you are making those interpretations. But if you were in the gallery, you you might not take the time to think through it, you know, whether it had a title or untitled or something. Um, abstract as well. A, a very good point and I, I'm a big believer in that there are things in, in artworks that the artist has no idea are there. You know that yeah. when we look at it we see them but he, he or she has no idea that that's even in their artwork. So um, Claire it says there are a lot of comments about is it light? Is it actually a light sculpture or a painting um, that looks like a sculpture. Just to clarify and also give you the title since since that did come up, um, it is actually a, a, a screen print. It's a print. It is um, the Russian Sea. So waves are definitely a part of this piece. Huh. And it's a screen print on paper. Uh, 39 and 3 quarters by 25 and 7 eighths is, are the dimensions. So the artist is uh, Lev Moros. And um, he is Russian, grew up and lived in the Soviet Union, and graduated from the Academy of Art in Leningrad in 1977. Um, no, 1927, I'm sorry, can't read my writing. Study at the, also studied at the Moscow uh, or Moscow Polygraphic Institute. He did graphic design and book illustration. He was in Soviet Russia, an art director of their largest sports magazine. Um, however, he felt as long as he stayed in Soviet Russia, he would never be able to express his true artistic side, uh, besides the fact he was Soviet Russia, but also because he was Jewish. So in 1975, with his wife and son, he moved to Los Angeles and arrived there speaking no English. Um, he worked as a screen printer or seriographer. Um, he now, he's still alive and he now owns two art galleries. And we also did some acting to make money when he first moved out there. He's done some artwork for uh, Walt Disney. Um, so that's the story on him. So now that we know it's the Russian Seed is, is the title. Does anybody have any other comments? Hmm. Hmm. And so what do we think? Is it art? Yes. Yes. And he knows there. So, so interesting, and I agree. You know, I think they're all art. So, but very good. Let's go ahead and move to the next one because now we're getting to um, a, a different format here. So we have a sculpture. So let's take a few moments, look at it, and then we will talk about it. Oh yeah. Oops. Hmm. 
it's nice to see the different views because when you turn it around or see it from a three-dimensional object from multiple views, it really gives you a much better perspective than just looking at it flat on paper. And, um, and that's a lesson I learned on Slow Art Fridays. I did a Slow Art Friday um, a month or two ago. It was all sculpture. And I learned what a challenge it is to look at sculpture um, on slides because you lose some of that. So, so um, when I worked with Christy to put this together, we deliberately added the views. Um, and so the, also, Kelly, if you could flip to the next slide, um, a little bit better view of the actual sculpture. I wanted you to see in that first one how it looked on, on its base and everything. But here's a bit closer look. Mm -hmm. So what do you see? What do you think is going on? I see a woman's face and almost like hair and a scarf. I mean, clearly it's made with multiple medium, whether it's wood or flowers or uh, lucite or fabric. And on the first one, especially, I see the outline almost of a woman's face and as if she has something in her hair and a scarf. And so, yes, you see the woman's face and I'm assuming that you're, um, which one of the three views kind of led you to, to go down that road? Mostly the first one, but the second, the middle one from the, almost looks from the back as if that's the back of a hat or hair and uh, less so in, in the third one. But in, in the first two, it looks like a, a side view portrait of a woman and maybe the back in the middle one, maybe the back of her head. So, and I'm just here because it's like, you're saying it right there, excellent. I mean, I can see exactly what you're talking about. And um, on the left, when you say that was the first thing you saw, what did that make you um, think it's a woman? Or sees that a woman in this? I think the flowers and the fabric and the scarf, the other attention to detail, the other pieces to me make it look as if it's a woman dressed with those things. Okay. And, uh, and then Claire says a jumbled person with many profiles, their shoes, clothes, other junk in their closet. I love the way you put that. There is a lot of objects here. Um, making this more complex, I think, than, than just a picture of a person. So, I mean, then with that, Kelly, if you would go one more slide, since Claire brought it up, here's some very <laughs> So, what do you see there, folks? Definitely a lot of texture. Mm -hmm. A lot of texture. And, and as you said, definitely, there's there's many different materials um, giving us many different textures. Um, Virginia sees a shoe. And um, so uh, what do you think about that shoe? Oh, yeah. It's old fashioned. Virginia also says, I thought I saw more than one um, profile. She also says it's a saddly shoe, Aww. or I think you mean saddle shoe, probably. Um, so uh, let's go back to your, your comment before that about more than one person. What do you see that makes you say that? On the most left-hand slide, uh, above w the profile of the woman, I thought I saw a second profile above that. That was another face. Well, Kelly, if we could go back one slide to the bigger, the larger view. Mm -hmm. Yes, on the top, that looked like a person as well. <clears throat> so you see at least two profiles there. Yes. So what else do we see? Uh, 
I would wonder how this was created in that if the um, artist, again, had an inspiration or an idea in mind or a sketch or just started taking pieces of objects that they owned or that would, were sentimental in some way and just started um, creating and weaving them together, so to speak. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't, you know, I don't know if he um, created those from a sketch or like you said, just let it evolve. The objects that are all what we would call found objects. Mm -hmm. So we didn't go to the rummage sale and buy a shoe and, and so on. These are all found objects. Mm -hmm. I'm noticing something in here. The um, What to me looks like maybe plexiglass and maybe I can get up a little closer. Yeah, this one with the colors on it looks like um, what we would use in printmaking. It kind of looks like the printmaking, uh, the inking plate mm. after a bunch of use um, before or like as it goes in the sink and starts to get rinsed off, the colors kind of start to drip like that. Um, that's what this reminds me of, but then somebody has maybe drawn another profile into it right here. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I can see that another profile, so a third person. Plus, what do you like to think about for a moment, and then definitely comment on if you if you choose, is there's a lot of stuff in these. You know, we talked about the shoe, a piece of plexiglass. There's flowers. There's stuff that I don't even know what it is. Um, kitchen tools. Um, what do you think? What does that say to you? Or what do you? Any thoughts on all that? I, I keep thinking it's somebody's brain and they're just, it's all these mumble jumble thoughts we have all day long and triggered just by different things. They may be fleeting. And I'm just thinking he, if he's got three different women or is it, or are they women, the features, it's just kind of illustrating the different thoughts, patterns we have. Cause you know, while you're sitting here, your mind goes wandering. I think that's just a depiction of wandering minds. So, so rather than maybe being the, the three profiles that we've seen so far, that, that rather than that possibly representing three individuals, you think it could just be three one, aspects one of the same person. ramblings, yeah. And good point. And also all the other stuff in there is yeah. just, like you said, the stuff that, that rolls around in your brain every day. To me, it kind of looks like objects that were um, the result of a scavenger hunt. <laughs> like, find something old, find something colorful, find something green. Does anybody else see anything they want to bring up? Let's talk about this artist then. Um, I think you all made some great observations here. Um, this artist is Lonnie Holly. It is, as we mentioned, found objects, wire, stone, paint, plexiglass. It's 68 inches tall um, and by two feet by two feet. Mm -hmm. So Lonnie, and the name of this, as you see, is for every woman I have seen, parts of Africa's dream in her honor. So mm -hmm. we mentioned that, you know, the different aspects, the different profiles, well, every woman. Um, I've ever seen parts of Africa and so on. So that's, there's a, it's a complex piece. Um, Lonnie Holly was born in 1950 in Birmingham, Alabama. He worked from the age of five. Um, he was the seventh of 27 children. Wow. And, and just as a side note, he himself has 15 children. Um, in his youth, he was in several foster homes, um, lived in different places. He did not have an idyllic childhood by any means. Mm -hmm. um, so his art was really born out of struggle and hardship. If you notice too, on the other artists, on all three of them I gave you where they had their art education. Lonnie is what we call a self-trained uh, or self-taught artist. He did not have any formal art education. And as we mentioned, his work is found objects, which is the, and the, so you know, Lonnie is also an African-American, so um, that influences his art as well. 
the found object, it, you know, he says, is the oldest tradition of African-American sculpture, which would make sense because, you know, in generations back, um, you know, especially back in, you know, slave days, African-Americans didn't have resources to buy art supplies. So um, they made do with what they could find. Um, his, he began art, his artistic life began when he carved tombstones for his sister's children who had died in a house fire. He used um, some chunks of soft sandstone-like byproduct of a foundry. And he believes that that was divine intervention that led him to materials, uh, to those materials to carve those tombstones and inspired his beginning in artwork. He is also a musician. And um, I encourage you strongly to go, when we break up today, when you have time, to look him up and read up on Lonnie Holly. He's a very interesting person. We could have probably spent the entire hour on Lonnie Holly. Um, and so now, Kelly, if you would start our movie, this will give you a little bit more insight into Lonnie Holly. Hmm, you have that power. Hmm. I'm just gonna switch my screen share. Where does he live? Or you might have said it. Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, okay, thank you. My grandfather had no rights to vote. Is my everyone seeing and hearing no that? To vote. Yes. My okay. mother had no rights to vote. My father had no rights to vote. I, I really want to talk to the humans about the distractions between the action of those that had participated and struggled and walked and bled and sweat and got beaten, dog bitten, had the hose pipe turned on them, being washed against brick walls with a thrust of a fire hose, being blocked out of situations, being stopped from eating the proper meal because of how they saw us come through the restaurant are not being allowed to go into the hotels. Remember, those people had to come out of the field, the plants and the foundries and factories. There were those that got killed along the way, literally got blown to pieces, bombs, and some of them was being hung and drugged and their blood was in the streets, on the highways, up and down the roads and the alleys. You're talking about the trail of tears, the mm -hmm. trail to vote. The work of art is mm -hmm. called In the Grip of Power. The machines say important. If this is not a rehearsal, the rehearsal time is over. It's like now it's time for action. So. The machine <laughs> or this work of art, I hope it would be saying it for the rest of my lifetime and lifetimes to come. Vote. 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 Wow. That's powerful. Mm. So I, I thought that was very timely on so many levels, you know, the vote with the upcoming election. And also if we tie that back to our, our theme today, is it art? You know, here is Lonnie Holly, again, creating art that might not necessarily be what we would consider traditionally beautiful things, but it very much communicates his point of view coming from a background that's foreign to probably all of us, if not most of us. And so that's another way to look at art. And, and with that said, I have us right at one o'clock. So any last questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you, Hank, for leading our discussion. And thank you, everyone, for joining and participating to keep it interesting. We hope you'll join us uh, next week for our program. We have Art with an Attitude. 
and that's being led by Michelle Weitzman-Dorf, who is a touring docent. Sorry, the next video started playing in the audio. That's what that was. Um, and so we, we uh, urge you to sign up and register on our website for that one, and we look forward to seeing you all there. So real quick before you connect, um, cut us all off, Lonnie Holly, I believe sometime in the future is going to be doing a benefit concert for the museum. He was supposed to be in Asheville, I think in April, and of course everything fell apart. And so that was unable to happen. That sometime, and Kelly, do you know any, is there any dates on that yet? Or do you know? I'm not sure if that's been rescheduled. Um, Christy was kind of the contact for that. It was supposed to be in April and he was also gonna participate in one of our um, family workshops. So yeah, we're looking forward to that happening again. I just don't know if it has been so, scheduled okay. yet. And I just want to say, so you all, if you are interested in that, just keep your eyes on the website, the emails, the Facebook page, however you keep up with your art museum news. And again, thank you all so very much for another great Star Friday. And I'll see you at the next one. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Bye. Happy weekend. You too.